Welcome to the Greenway Outdoors podcast. The Greenway Outdoors is also an internationally syndicated TV show on Pursuit Channel and Wild TV. You are now tuned into our weekly podcast hosted by executive producer Kyle Green, production coordinator Jeff Hutchinson, director AJ Beadle, and creative producer Ryan Parks. We live in a world where our natural resources are almost solely protected by funds raised by hunters and fishermen, with over 60% of those funds coming from white males over the age of 55. The Green Bay Outdoors team has set out on a mission to create content that would inspire millennials, Generation Z, and new sportsmen and women to get out, hunt, fish, and contribute towards conservation and the betterment of our planet. Welcome to the Green Bay Outdoors. Hello and welcome to episode 8 of the Greenway Outdoors podcast. I am Kyle. I'm Ryan Parks. And today we have a special guest who's actually also... Special how? Special. Um, I don't know if I want to say how special he is. Uh, no, he's actually my dad. Um, he's joining us today to discuss some things. Um, so This uh, is the last time I think we'll actually be able to secure your dad as a guest on the show. I'm going to call him Mr. Parks the whole time to just drive him crazy. You can call him Jeff <laughs> if you want to. But he's an adult, so you're supposed to call him that. Anyone who's older than you. Anyone that's older than you. But I think this is the last time we'll be able to secure him in the radio show. You know why? Why? Because he makes a guest appearance on an episode of the Greenway Outdoors TV show oh, on yep. the Pursuit Channel. Yeah. Uh, and a grouse episode. Yeah, that was and, a good one. Uh, uh, I looked through some of the footage and... Uh, um, you know, the angles that we got on him, I just think the ladies will have him too busy to <laughs> actually, he won't consider being I'm sure my mom back. will be happy about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, she's listening. This is the beginning of my modeling career. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Um, so, Mr. Parks, we're going to get right into the, uh, the introduction of everything, but can you talk about kind of your background? Because I've never gone with anyone more knowledgeable in grouse hunting, but like what other background do you have in hunting and fishing? Because when we went out, in the grouse episode, and everybody will see it, they're going to learn a lot about grouse and grouse hunting. So what's your background, mm -hmm. and what do you enjoy doing the most in the outdoors? Uh, woodcock and grouse hunting is what I enjoy the most. I started very at a very young age going out uh, trapping or hunting with my dad, and that's how I started learning the basics. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started hunting with a, the Silver Streak Sheridan air gun. Really? Yep. They're harder to hit with that, I would assume. Much harder. You gotta get, you gotta get much closer. <laughs> yeah. It was a pretty quick uh, advance to the a 410 and a 22 and uh, and trapping. Mm -hmm. From there, graduated on up to the the pheasant hunting when there was pheasants and deer. Yeah, they're not as prevalent now. Mostly what I concentrated on. Yeah. Yeah. There's plenty of deer. Yeah. Well, you grew up in the Jackson area, so deer hunting was. I had no no idea how well I had it. Yeah, that's a good area in Michigan so to be spoiled. for deer hunting. There were big deer that died of old age. Really? Yeah. Yeah, that's it's not. Which that. is on you, that doesn't happen anymore. No, what is that old age? No, yeah, yeah. Like, the populations are so high right now still, but that's yeah in the Jackson County specifically is just known as like the trophy yeah. county in the state. You've got two dogs. Java and Lil, who actually are in the show. And if actually the beginning of the intro of this podcast, in the video, that's actually Mr. Parks' hand touching Java. Yep. And Java takes off down the hill. Yeah. But tell us about the dogs and how you trained them and uh, um, how you use them. The uh, the dogs are German short hair mm -hmm. pointers. Um, I got them as a... a Male, female kennel mates, or not kennel mates, they're, they were uh, brother and sister. I trained them myself by reading multiple videos, talking to friends about their uh, training methods, mm -hmm. um, and then just started hunting them. And progressively, they became extremely good. I it might uh, boast extremely they're incredible. good uh, grouse and uh, woodcock hunting dogs. There was a period of time I also used them to ban woodcock with. Really? Yes. Ban banning woodcock, so they would help point the woodcock on the ground, then, or how did that work? Yeah, you, you first you have to go through a certification process with the uh, the Woodcock Banders Association. They'll certify you. Actually, they're certifying your dogs. And once you become certified, then you can in the springtime. Uh, you go through the class to, to record the data. Your, your dogs get checked out uh, to make sure that they will perform the way they need to to, to 
They're not eating baby woodcocks on the run. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Or bringing them back to you. And just to go back a step, who's who's certifying you? Is it the state of Michigan? or It's or? it's through the state of Michigan. Okay. It's, a, it's a program that Al Stewart and Lori Sargent from the DNR run, which is, it's an excellent program for keeping track of the of the, uh, the migration of the woodcock is what the, the tagging is for. They have other programs um, to do bird counts. Mm-hmm. Uh, that they, they count the springing uh, or the, the singing males in the spring to determine the number of birds. When you say singing males, what does that mean? That means a, a woodcock will make a very specific ground, a sound when it's on the ground. Okay. It's called a peent. A peent. It, it, it's like a buzz. You've heard it in the spring. Yeah. And you you don't even you think it's a yeah. bug that you heard. Yeah, sounds. You like know it. what? Actually, it's really funny. Uh, the drumming of a grouse. I remember I came in from deer hunting one time, and I said to my dad, I was like, "Did you hear that guy trying to start that lawnmower the whole day?" <laughs> and I That's go, funny. "That tractor or whatever it was would not start." I just heard it in the distance the whole time. He goes, "What are you talking about? What it sounded like?" And I was like, "It was like thunk thunk." he's like those are grouse and i was like oh because like the whole day i'm like and then i'm hearing them all over the place and it's like i now i had trouble determining where this guy was starting to start the tractor he's like no that's that yeah. would be a grouse but yeah. go on <laughs> that and just just for a side note that grouse will usually be within two or three hundred yards of that drumming log that, okay that's, that, that's, that's their territory that's yeah. their territory and they will fight over it and they'll poop all over it too all, right all over it so the, the the woodcock banding that you get your dog certified, you get trained in how to do it. You're then going out in the springtime. Usually it's uh, around May first is usually when the chicks start showing up, and uh, you run your dogs through. Your dogs point. Usually what what they'll point is the hen, and you try to capture the hen in a net if you can. If not, you have to watch really close to where the hen takes off from. Normally, the chicks are going to be very close to there, and there you can see the pictures of the and tiny little things. Now, in that picture, <laughs> I knew they were going to be cute because Timberdoodle are cute in general, but the babies are just adorable. <laughs> when they're in that picture, they're easy to see. If you sure. move, if you move back, and they're in their normal habitat, they'll lay down on the ground when the mom flies away, and you can't see them at all. And the way you find them is you see the eye and the beak. Okay. And that's and that's what you. It's like what you watch. That's for. what you look for. It's like was it. I think it's Fred Bear that said, "You don't look for a deer, you don't look for an animal, you look for movement." Right, with, right, with, with right. And and they don't move. Oh. They they will <laughs> lay on the ground, and you can walk right over the top of them, and they will not move. How long does it take before they get that wild beak? That that's born uh, at 14 millimeters, and it will grow two millimeters every day, and for about three weeks. By three weeks, those the the birds are almost full grown. No kidding. They can, that's they, quick. Very quick. They can fly in two weeks. That, that's extremely fast for a bird. Yeah, I, I know things that gr- I know birds grow fast in general, and I'm always like astounded by like ducks and geese where like they're born in April or May, and then they're like full grown, ready to shoot in September, October. But this is I like how my terms are like ready to shoot. Like, that's <laughs> yeah, like how yeah. I think of it. <laughs> it's like they're ready to eat at that point. But that's that's what that's the one. They're ready to eat. Yeah. Well, with banding, isn't you can ban the chicks at such a young age because their legs don't change in size. It's something like that, right? Right. Yeah. You can, that's one of the very few birds that you can ban the the first day out of the nest. You can put the band on them, and it won't restrict their leg when they're an adult. Yeah, they're already talking by day two. So. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 So you, you. So let's let's go back. So you get, go through the training, get the course, get everything that you need from the DNR, get certified. Then you're going out, and your dogs are going out. Like they would a hunt? Yes. Like, is there like different commands or different, how do you instill the different philosophy in the dog for like what's happening? It's exactly the same philosophy for... Mentally, for the dog. For the dog. It's, it, your dog has to be steady to wing, uh, which means when the bird flies away, the dog doesn't move. It stays exactly where it's at and it doesn't move forward. You you then put the dog on wall or or if uh, or tie it off to a tree and then you move up and try to find the chicks. Preferably, just teach your dog to stay on wall, which means stay. Don't move your feet. Yeah, one there's, step. There's yeah, because we need to hear. And right? and you don't want the dog to follow its instinct of let's chase that. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's why I mean, hours of work has been have been put into those dogs getting up at five in the morning during the summers and. Hearing them 
Java gum. Little gum. <laughs> <laughs> They're cute though. It's funny. Yeah. It's funny because um, Java and Lil. I think like, we have a picture of Lil, the white dog in the bed. Uh huh. That's that's how you get a dog. If we can show that again, uh, there's a. This is how you get a good dog. Yeah, you that, have to treat him right, like that. Oh, <laughs> that's so cute. Yeah, well, Lil's a lover. Oh yeah. When we were up north at um, uh, the property, when we filmed the episode. I was laying on the couch and she was like coming up and she's like, she gets up and then she like looks to see if he's looking before yeah. she like gets up on anything. She's like, is he going to see me? And then she'll like get up and she'll like lay on you and yeah. then she'll like count on you to like protect her from whatever <laughs> yeah. so like consequences are coming for what she's done. If you're sitting by a campfire and you start petting her and you're just talking, pretty soon she'll be on your lap and you don't even know how <laughs> I it love Yeah, it. She, she slowly sneaks one paw up what and I then the other paw. What I like about them is, though, is that, uh, like, both dogs, they're so loving and cute, but also, like, super disciplined hunting dogs. Because, like, yeah. a lot of people are, like, Jeff and I have talked about it before, like, people that have hunting dogs, they treat them, like, specifically, that's all they are is hunting dogs. Like, sometimes they don't even name them. They're like, hunt dog. And then, like, the dog comes they're over and like, it's, like, they like keep Ray. it in the garage. Yeah. Or like outside or whatever. I'm like, I want to love them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Those, I mean, those good. They're good family dogs, but they were bred with a purpose. Right. And their job is to hunt, and they have they're very high energy. And it's like, what happened? They it was when it won Dog of the Year or whatever it was called. Everyone went out and bought one. Yeah. Everybody. Everybody thought the at the. Uh what, I don't remember what the show was. Well, I don't know what it's called. The, <laughs> there was a dog show, and the, and the German short hair was the number one dog, so everybody went out and bought a German short hair because it's such right. a beautiful dog. Well, it's too high energy. It's just the beagle won one year, so everybody went out and bought beagles. Well, there was a whole bunch of people who had beagles who didn't like beagles. Right. <laughs> yeah. it, well, it's, it's such a dedication to training a dog. It's not what anyone thinks. It's not the same all. reason why. It's like... And I was talking about wanting a golden retriever named Spoon, but uh, <laughs> yeah. when I wanted a golden retriever so bad, Ryan's like, "Why would you do that? They, I don't, like, I can't, don't. There's no purpose." I'm like, "I'm gonna love them because I know I don't have the time and the dedication that you owe to the dog to be able to perform well. Otherwise, you're just out there screaming at a dog that's never gonna be able to perform the way they want to. And yeah. it's it's a bad relationship. We uh, we call them swamp collies. Swamp collies. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the golden retrievers. <laughs> yeah. I can see that. That everything gets on them. Is yes. that why or what? Yeah, is that's, it? that's part of it. Yeah, they like come and, out. And they're just they're just that low, docile <laughs> They're so sweet, attitude. though. They are sweet. They're sweet. They just want yeah. love. But they're pretty forceful about it. Yeah. Christy has, too. And, like, when I used to watch those ones when she'd be out of town or whatever, they, like, bear will get on your chest to get pet. You yeah. know what I mean? It, yeah, like, they think they're lap dogs. You'll wake up, and they're under the cover sleeping like a human being on the pillow, <laughs> nose to nose with you, and you're like, hey. <laughs> yeah. It's weird when you wake up, and they were already up. You're like, and what? They're staring you at staring you? At How long were you awake? <laughs> 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 but uh, so you go out, <clears throat> and then you net them, and then you band them. Now, my question is, um, have you ever shot a banded woodcock then since you banded them? I, ha I have not ever shot a. Uh, oh. or, and, and none of the guys that I've done the banding with have shot a uh, banded woodcock. You kind of avoid. You, you kind of avoid the area where you did banding in. It's really? Just, yeah. It's, it's like just, a just it like just a doesn't seem, It just doesn't seem right. Because well, like tell, you know too much. Well, tell them. Migratory wise, what happens? Oh yeah, migra and migratory wise, the, it is not uncommon for a banded bird to be shot almost exactly in the same location where it was banded. Because they're just chilling there. They, and they'll re, no, they'll, they're, they're migratory. They migrate. To, but they, they hit the same exact spot. They migrate to Louisiana, the Panhandle, and but they'll they'll come back. It's not uncommon for them to come back to exactly the same spot they were born. That's no kidding. Yeah. You wonder how they just get programmed like that. I mean, the pigeons have it in their head. It's they have like an internal compass that, like the homing pigeons, they know exactly where to go. After you could bring them miles away, and they'll go right back. It's just amazing. Me, like always, like too, like with the wild turkey, like the brilliance of how smart a wild turkey is. And then once in a while, you just be like, "What a stupid move!" By that <laughs> yeah. Like it's like they like they, there's so there's things about these birds like that they're just so brilliant in some ways, and then other ways it's like. What were you? Yeah. What were you thinking? What, what, yeah. What were you trying you to do there? You used up all the brain on the uh, <laughs> on the, the honing skills. Yeah. But so you've never actually shot one yourself that you went out. That I banded. No, I've no. never shot a banded. Or, or a banded woodcock. I've never know. banded. A... I know it's more rare because there's less people banding woodcock than say ducks. I would think, right? There is, and usually the ducks are done uh, by the DNR. Mm -hmm. um, they do it at the managed waterfowl areas every year. Yeah. They do a big thing. They have a bunch of volunteers come out and help. And they put at these big cages. They get in. They can't get out. 
Then mm. they go in and oh, okay. And then a lot of them are shot just like that. <laughs> but it's funny too, like talking about like birds getting shot in the same group. We had a uh, um, we had a uh, a friend of ours, uh, Scott was talking to, who went out and uh, his first time goose hunting ever, and a flock came in and he shot two birds out of the flock. And then the um, the flock circled back around again, and he shot another bird out of the flock. All three were banded. Really? Like no a, kidding. Like a couple weeks earlier, right there, <laughs> because like he they just banded a family, and that family happened yeah, they, to come into his decoys, and he lit them up. They're still you know? in the area. Yeah. Huh. So it's just kind of funny. He's like, I got three bands. I'm like, you, sh- you just don't. <laughs> yeah. You don't understand. It's like, it's like the kids that grown up rich. They just don't understand what they got. Yeah. You know what I mean. Yeah. Just, oh yeah. They just don't get. There's like the appreciation isn't there. Yeah. That's rare, and to get three is. Ex- even more rare. So the the woodcock banders, the group of woodcock banders, are all volunteer. They're all. It, it started as a as a DNR program in the 1960s, and they started it originally to start uh, testing for heavy metals in the birds. Oh. To to see if. That, what do you do? Run a metal detector down them? Yes. <laughs> they have to, they have to see if they got lead in them. Um, the. How do they test that though on a live bird? Or are they? Do they, they kill them? Are they killing them? Yeah. Really? Yeah, I don't. I, yeah, I, they banned I, I them think, anyways. I think they were well. <laughs> they they would they would take one bird. I, my understanding was they would take one bird and then they would ban the rest. Oh, okay. Um, and then see if that one would they take a chick or an older one? Or Am I getting too specific they, on they, something? I, I believe they were. Uh, I believe they would take a chick. Okay. But they, they, they were doing it because the population was in was they knew it. They assumed the population was in decline, and they were trying to determine what the what the. It's cause still was. declining now, right? It is still slowly declining, except for in Michigan. Since 2007, there has been an upturn in the woodcock population. What would you attribute that to? Um, I think it's due to the DNR's management of its forests. Really. And it's uh, creating the habitat that woodcock need. Uh, uh, and that's helping to increase the population of the woodcock. Well, we did stuff with the Rough Grouse Society. We went out and did tree plantings and stuff like that to help the habitat for grouse and woodcock. And uh, I was, like, surprised by how much we did. Like, the types of trees that we planted were food sources for them. And they did a burn near it, yeah, um, which was supposed to help. And, I mean, I've seen firsthand what the Rough Grouse Society does. And they, they use a lot of the – they're ranked really high on the percentage of, like, you know how like the Sportsman Alliance has like that super super high quality of like ninety six percent or something of every dollar that goes in like is spent the way that it's supposed to be and stuff. Not that they waste the four percent; they have to have employees and stuff. But um, Rough Grouse Society has a similar uh, high end percentage of that, so they're a good group to give to yeah. as well. And a big thing that I've learned from you over the years is like clear cuts is one of the biggest things that doesn't only help woodcock the, the woodcock population it helps a significant amount of other there's 128 species that use a clear cut whereas a mature forest there's between there's somewhere between 25 to 35 yeah. species that will use the in michigan mature, or just in, in general in, 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 yeah. well it's probably pretty close in the, in the north okay. in the north where there's a you're going to find grouse. This climate. Yeah, you're going to find grouse around where there's popple trees because they use the popple. Usually, that's their primary source of food to get through the winter. What happens with grouse in the winter? Because I know the woodcock migrate. Do the grouse migrate? What happens grouse, there? Grouse don't migrate. They usually stay in the habitat. They'll usually move into a uh, clear cut uh, that is somewhere between 5 and 15 years old, and they eat the buds off of the, uh, the popple trees. How do they stay warm? They. Uh, this is pretty cool. How they- sometimes they'll roost if you don't have a, a deep snow. They'll roost, but that leaves them. Uh, they'll be predated, or uh, the predation will be heavier by uh, horned owls. If the snow's deep enough, they'll actually tunnel into the snow, under the snow, and they'll hang out in that little snow cave. They make or, their little they, snow fort. And yeah, they, I like it. Or they go underneath the chocolate. spruce tree. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was kind of hoping for that. <laughs> Yeah. Just wondering how they made. I always wondered how they made the hot chocolate. Yeah, yeah. well, without thumbs, they'll keep their secrets. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he can't tell us everything. Ryan put together a philosophical question that I'm curious on how he's going to pay the all the um the other side of it and at least talk about it. But for I'll, philosophical, I'll recognize the other side. Recognize it, but don't get carried away. Yeah, I don't want anyone thinking you're weird. Yeah, but the question is pretty simple, and it's is hunting moral. And 
I'm going to let you start on this so you can tell me what the other side is so I can eat your soul oh. with it. But, like, uh, where, where were you going with this? Like, why did you pick this? Well, I mean, it, it's a simple question, but it can you could talk hours about this sure. with someone who's anti-hunting. Um, a lot of the anti-hunters are just city folk who... Uh, they just don't think it, it at this point in civilization. I like that you said city folk. You so you so country boy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in the heavy bigger cities, Chicago, New York, over in California, they all it, it's not a thing for them. They've never been raised around it. They were raised in a city. You just go down the road, and on the corner you get all your food. Why why would you make an animal suffer? Why would you have to? Yeah, nothing should die. Yeah, nothing should die. <laughs> Even though those same people will go straight down to. The market. The, the market and buy all their steak and everything. But if you haven't been raised around it and you don't understand it, which is what we're trying to do, we're trying to help people understand what hunters do and what, what hunting means for conservation is it's important. And they, they don't just don't realize it because they haven't been raised around it. Well, we've been, we've been omnivores for a very, very long time. And the idea of not eating meat and it, there's a lot of proof that shows scientifically that we were likely scavengers um, yeah. in the in the beginning, where um, before we were adal adal What is it called? I have no clue. Adal the 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 weapon. What am I thinking of? Adaladal. Is that how you said? That's as close as I'm going to get. Okay. <laughs> so it before we were using that, and then in bows and everything else, that we were likely um, scavengers of meat, and that there's like just digging off carcasses and stuff. A lot of a lot of hints of that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, where it's like. Just cook it a little bit more and salt it and you'd be all right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. But um, so we've been eating meat since like since we've been around, since really the beginning of time. And when you go to it and you really get down to it, when you come to this the last like let's say twenty, thirty years, where this vegan slash vegetarian spike has really happened, mm -hmm. um, that in comparison to how long we've been on the earth, it's like a very, 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 very minute less than 1% group that would subscribe to this. Yet in this day and age, it seems like if you're not, you're like a bad person. Yeah. And the idea that no animal should die, you know, we are given dominion over all the animals. So to manage them properly gives them value. So like when you look at it like this, let's use the deer population uh, as, a, as an example. And then we can even touch on even Africa and the value that they have and how that is starting from the ground up there. In America, you've got more white-tailed deer in the United States of America than ever in history, right? Well, that is simple because they have a lot of value to hunters. So there's a lot of precautions put in place to protect their habitat, to enhance their habitat, to manage the species, to protect the species, disease control, anti-poaching efforts. All the things that go into it are funded by the people that treat it like a resource. So I pay for a license because I want those dollars to go into this. I join Whitetails Unlimited. I join this. I join the Sportsman Alliance because I want these things protected so that that resource is there continuously for a long time. And the other thing is with deer, with the success story that they are, they require a harvest. Can you imagine how terrible it would be for the deer population if for one year we stopped hunting? Do you know what that would do to it? Two, uh, with, if you start with two deer in seven years, they can make 40 deer, starting with two deer. So if you don't harvest and make room for this year's young, they won't all survive the winter. There's, They'll keep reproducing, but the habitat won't keep growing right? and can only sustain so many. And so if you don't take out the mature deer and use them like a resource, then the little ones won't survive and you won't keep the population going. Right. So it, it, it actually, it's ethical to do a harvest every year. Of the deer, because if we don't, if we don't kill a, th what do we kill, like a third of them or something like that every year, or a fifth, or I, I don't know. It's, it's about an eighth. An eighth, okay. <laughs> I love having him here. <laughs> but it's like, kill, if we didn't kill an eighth of them every year and the new one's coming in, I mean, we'd be in big, big, big trouble. Yeah, you know? yeah and if you, another thing that comes along with not killing them off, and I think we have a lot of problems with that with some of the bird populations, is you run the risk of having a sickness run through all of them and kill them all off. That's, right. That's what's happening with the caribou population right now. There's no caribou hunting right now because the caribou have gone into horrible decline due to the chronic wasting that's in Canada. 
Really? I just watched a movie with my dad on Christmas. It was a Disney movie, but it wasn't Disney-like. I forgot what it was called, and that's Was it called Bambi? No. <laughs> <laughs> Old Yeller? No, it was no, it wasn't a cartoon. It was made by Disney, but it was about a guy that went to um, Caribou. Uh, he he kind of lost a bet or something, and then ended up having to go to, um, I think it was Alaska, and he goes like into the middle of nowhere to study why the Caribou population is going down, and they think it's the wolves that's doing it. Um, and punchline, but that it doesn't matter. But you still watch the movie. But um, essentially, he found out that the wolf population was helping the caribou. And this isn't in everything, so do not quote me as thinking that, like, wolves are good for the environment because a lot of situations they're not, so don't quote me for that. <laughs> but um, the wolf populations there were the only thing keeping the caribou numbers in check because there wasn't a lot of people hunting that area. Right. So once the, um, the wolves were actually helping the caribou and the numbers were falling because there was too many and then there was a, a, a collapse because of it. There's too many, not enough food, therefore collapse. And uh, it's the same thing with the deer population. And it's it's conversations like these, and we can continue to go off on a tangent, but um, you have to understand that I'm talk, everything I've talked about, everything that Mr. Parks has said, everything that you've said has dealt with managing the, the item. Yeah. People are here to stay. There's too many of us. Let's, let's be honest. Okay? <laughs> yeah. There's too many people, and we're here, and no one in their right mind is going to think that human beings should be cold. So if we're... Human beings are going to be here. We're going to take up the space that we are. We have to, we owe it to the planet to manage the resources that are here properly because we already took up too much room. So what we have left, we have to protect and manage properly. Right. And to be honest with you, the only people doing that, the only people, the only people doing that are the hunters and fishermen that are paying to protect those things because they treat them like a resource, because they utilize them like a resource. And the science and the mindset of... Uh, knowing why you have to kill certain animals, knowing why you have to hunt certain animals, knowing what predators are important, which ones are you know dangerous to the ecosystem, and understanding all of that is why we have the Department of Natural Resources. And in some instances, they do a good job. In some instances, I think they could be better managed. But then you have the um, conservation organizations that come in as well, again, completely funded by hunters and fishermen who are treating those resources well. It would be a sad, sad day to see what would happen to the deer herd, to the turkeys, to everything. If, you know, in 1960, the wild turkey was almost extinct yeah. because of hunters' dollars and conservation efforts in Michigan. Hunters' dollars and conservation efforts that were put in, now we have a huntable population. When I buy a $30 tag, that reintroduces a few, let's say, three to five wild turkeys into the wild, and I take maybe one if I'm lucky. If you're Jeffrey, you're not going to get one. So, <laughs> so you're, this, Jeff. you're paying that. No, not this one. I, if you're paying that money and you're putting that resource in, that's like a a really simple thing to understand. So when someone's like, well, how could you shoot that wild turkey? It's like, well, that tag did this, this, and this. And they're like, well, why couldn't you just put that money in anyways? I was like, well, why didn't you? Right. And they're like, you know, well, yeah. uh, uh, exactly. So it's only the people that truly have value for the resource that are going to protect it. And I'm not going to sit around and wait for the PETA people to quit complaining and start putting in money towards conservation when they don't know anything about it. They don't understand it, and they're not going to do anything. To, are they going to call the deer herd? Are they going to protect it? Or are they going to go into Ann Arbor and start knocking deer out with tranquilizers and cutting their dicks off? I mean, it's, it's, that's literally what they're doing right now. It's insane. So you got to think. like You have to use practical thinking to understand like how this should actually work. Yeah. So there's my rant. But no, no, tell me about why uh, you know, hunting's moral. <laughs> um, another thing, Ted Nugent brought this up in one of his podcasts was – that you can't be a vegan and think you're not killing any animals. Ooh, I love this. Go on. When you in your soybean fields, when you if you're not eating meat, you're eating those soybeans and yeah, in those for tofu so, for to, your tofu. And in those fields, there's hundreds of little animals that live all over in that field. And they want to eat it. And there's little baby deer laying down in those fields. And when those combines come through, they just which you would have witnessed this before. That was Growing up on the farm, baling hay, you'd run, you'd run a fawn through the hay baler. It, it you just, yeah, and that's nothing like, against farming, but towards the vegans, you don't, you're not, you think you're not killing animals, but you are, and you, because you're, and you're not promoting, you're not putting anything towards conservation or helping the outdoors. No, you're not. And to, to explain it even further, basically what Uncle Ted was saying was, <laughs> um, you are. The farmers have to run the combines through the field. The reason why the birds follow combines, that's the big tractor thing that you see on the side of the road going, going through the fields, harvesting everything. 
those combines kill shrews and rabbits and squirrels and everything in its way. And that's why the birds follow it in order to uh, in order to eat whatever's left over, right. you know, from that. Not the plants, but the, the animal carcasses that get flipped through it. Right. So not only that, the farmers have to kill everything that would eat the crops because if they don't, then there's not going to be enough crops in order to make a profit, in order to, to sell it, in order for you to have your tofu. So as someone that eats tofu, you're killing more animals than the one arrow it takes me to kill one deer. Right. And they don't know that, though, because they don't understand the practicalities of like how farming. And they're like, well, our farming practices need to be better. No, no, no. If there's animals that, air, that are there that eat the crops, you, you, that, that's it. They ate the crops. So it's like. You right. didn't eat it now, and so you have to get rid of them for that to exist. It just doesn't – we're here to stay. You're, so You're contributing nothing in that way too. Contributing to, absolutely nothing. And hunters and are – That's nothing against – again, nothing against soybean farmers. God bless them. They have to create – Make a living. They make – well, they're, they're creating crops. Right. To sell. Yeah. I to mean, the vegans and it, that don't kill I mean, animals. Who, I don't really care about vegans or if you are a vegan, whatever, but it's just the anti-hunting – Vegans no, I got who, nothing against who, people that are vegan, just people that are vegan that attack our ways because right. they think that theirs is so high and mighty and they've never contributed to killing an animal, and that's right. insane. It's insanity. If you live on this planet, you're contributing towards that because there's just too much going on. Where do you think you, you, your plants are the same way? Your your trees, your apple trees, and the, the, your everything that you consume, just because it's not an animal doesn't mean that animals didn't die to produce it. And that's just, you'd think common sense, but like they just don't know. Right. Just driving down the road, you're taking them out. Right. Yeah. 50,000 deer are hitting the road every year in Michigan. When we come back from break, we're actually going to be talking about how to stay up on the laws and everything going on. Stay tuned. The Sportsman's Alliance works to protect your outdoor passions. For nearly four decades, the Sportsman's Alliance has fought to protect and advance hunting, fishing, trapping, and shooting in all 50 state legislatures, in the courts, in Congress, and at the ballot box. The Sportsman's Alliance continues to be the leading organization fighting coast to coast against any legislation or action that threatens your outdoor heritage, while also proactively advancing legislation that allows more opportunities for sportsmen and their families. The future of our outdoor heritage rests with the passion of sportsmen. By becoming a member of Sportsman's Alliance, you'll take an important step to help protect and promote hunting, fishing, and trapping from attacks by animal rights activists. Join the Sportsman's Alliance today to create a powerful and unified voice for sportsmen across the country. Take the guesswork out of diver duck hunting with Jeremy Ullman of MI Guide Service. Offering everything you need for a successful hunt at great prices, you're sure to have a blast. We offer open water blind and layout hunts in Lake St. Clair, Saginaw Bay, as well as custom hunts in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. We've also got your fishing needs covered with trips available in every season. Go to miguideservice.com to book your hunt or fishing trip today. Eagle Review is the review and ratings platform for thousands of international shooting and fishing destinations for virtually every game species. It is free of charge and it helps you to find the perfect place and to book your fishing and shooting trips directly with the owner or agent. You can easily find unique places in virtually every corner of the world. Find your dream destination by selecting a location, a method, and the species that you are interested in. Once you've made a selection, you can easily compare destinations and find out what other people have to say about their experiences. It's the way to find your dream adventure, compare your options and choose your trip. You can then help others finding their dream adventure by writing your review. So join the community and share your passion. Eagle Review. Find your dream shooting and fishing destinations. Hot Shot Outfitters in Port Hope, Michigan is the destination for whitetail deer, crow, waterfowl, rabbit, predator, and turkey hunts. We have cabins, over 30,000 non-fenced acres, and a passion for delivering fair chase hunts to you and your family. Reserve your hunt at hotshotoutfitters.com today. Hello and welcome back to episode eight of the Greenway Outdoors podcast. So, we've been talking about 
woodcock banding. We've been talking about uh, vegans. We've been talking about all kinds of stuff. Soybean fields. And, Ryan, you wanted to touch on real quick, and this is something that, uh, especially for deer hunters, seems to be frustrating year in, year out, is the ever-changing laws um, and how to keep up on them. Yeah. So, every year, I mean, we were just talking about this. If if you're a hunter and you hunt a broad spectrum of animals, it's very difficult to keep up with what you can hunt when and where and what you can use and how you can do it and if you can bait, if you can't bait, and... I find it very difficult to keep up, keep up to date on that just because wherever we go, nothing against the DNR, but sometimes it's very difficult to locate what you need to read yeah, and, and what you need to know about simple. hunting. Yeah, it's not a simple thing to go to the DNR website, wherever, whatever state you're in, mm-hmm. and read all the laws on whatever you're going after. And, I mean, that's obviously very important because they could get, you could be doing something one way for since you were a kid and then one year they change it, but you didn't read the laws ever or get updated on it or notified or any in any way. Right. And the officer happens to be out there and checks you and dings you for it. And then who knows, you're not hunting for the next however many. Yeah. You lost your truck, your gun, and you're in jail. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. I, 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 obviously, that's an extreme example. But in the same token, when I look at those kind of situations, I identified that the communication between the DNR and people and hunters doesn't always seem to be positive. Yeah. And I think it should be because we're all kind of in it together and we're yeah. all kind of relying on each other together. And there's obviously you're never going to please everybody, especially um, hunters tend to be an opinionated group. Yeah, so they not, have a stigma that comes yeah, with them. Yeah, and you're not going to please everybody, but that was kind of the idea for our wild game dinner. So we have four wild game dinners coming up in February and then early March. One's in um, Pennsylvania, one's in Michigan, one is in Ohio, and one is in Wisconsin. And we're going to be updating that on our website, thegreenmeoutdoors.com. Probably somewhere around January 1st, you'll be able to see it and start buying tickets and stuff like that. Wild game dinners are super fun, gives you an opportunity to try a different game. And we're actually serving real wild game. But the idea of the event, and we're going to be working with New Radio Media on this as well and streaming it, is a direct interaction between the Department of Natural Resources and the Sportsman Alliance. And the Sportsman Alliance does so much from the legal aspect. And Mm -hmm. they do a lot on the ground floor, too. Make no mistake about it. They don't get the credit for it, but like their programs are incredible. Yeah, they do a lot of work. But aside from that, they kind of handle the legal aspect um, in dealing with, like, for instance, if someone from the outside was trying to make it so it was illegal to bear hunt, they would be the ones fighting it to make sure that, you know, you'd keep your rights as a hunter. So they protect our rights in the courts. The DNR is kind of the hands-on operation for uh, managing the natural resources. So they're twofold very important. And then for whatever reason, our ugly mugs will be up there too. (laughs) But uh, uh, the idea is we're going to create an opportunity for people to come to the Wild Game Dinner, write out their questions, comments, concerns to the DNR or the Sportsman Alliance about what's going on specifically in their area. And then we're going to address them on a live panel directly to the audience there at the Wild Game Dinner and answer the questions that they're so, so concerned about. This will give the DNR the opportunity to um, teach people about what they're doing. Because sometimes it's like, hey, we raised the prices on this tag by $5. And they're like, well, why would you do that? And everyone throws a fit. And they're like, what are they spending it on? Blah, blah, right. blah, blah. And then you hear all the hunters complaining. But like the message of why they did it didn't quite get delivered. So what I'm trying to do is mend that relationship. We need the DNR. We need the Sportsman Alliance. So I want to mend the relationships and give people the opportunity to questions, comments, concerns directly to them so that they can answer back and realize we're all kind of on the same team and kind of come to better terms. I believe that this will also give the DNR and the Sportsman Alliance a better opportunity to understand what the ground floor concerns are for the people that are actually, um, you know, the actual hunters that are out there. It'll give them the ground floor opportunity to actually go through those concerns and everything like that you know and i think that's pretty crucial yeah i i there's just a at no one's fault but there's a disconnect between the dnr and hunters and i think that this is a big opportunity for people to get closer with them because like you said we're all on the same team we're all working for the same thing and and they do a lot of good they don't get credit for it oh oh, absolutely you know there is a law that ted nugent actually talked about again not to quote him twice but um (laughs) that he talked about and he's pretty loud and he's got his opinions and everything like that you know always has one of the things he brought up was like the mismanagement of the cranes in michigan yeah and uh um that was concerning to me was you know as a farmer there's enough cranes that the farmers can uh receive permits to kill the sandhill cranes but they're not allowed to eat them 
Now, sandhill cranes are literally made out of ribeye steaks. That's what they made out of. So <laughs> Right out of the factory. Right. They just stuffed the ribeye right into them. Sandhill cranes, it's a game bird. It's an actual game bird yeah. that people hunt in other states, and they're supposedly the best-tasting table fare there is on the planet. Yeah. So you've got something that tastes great, and is there's a population that you're able to hunt them. But here, because they don't have a hunting pot, um, they don't have a hunting season for it, or a, a conservation program put in place. It's illegal to hunt them, but the farmers can to save their crops. But the farmers aren't allowed to eat them because that would be like hunting to consume, and there isn't a program for that. Right. So you can kill them, but you can't eat them. You yeah. have to just bury them, or burn them, or leave them. And to me, that's like the ultimate disrespect to the bird, and it's the ultimate disrespect to the species. It's the it's just and it's real dumb. So it's yeah. like, like there's like no other words for it. So like, what was their philosophy behind that? And that was like a concern that I would bring up to them. And maybe they have like an excellent scientific answer that makes complete sense. I don't see that being the case. And maybe it's just something they haven't got to. Maybe it's something that like the laws, well, no one specifically thought that would be a good idea, but the way the laws were written, it just led to that. And we're working on fixing it. And what do you guys think? It might be that simple of a conversation, but nonetheless, the conversation needs to be there. Right. You know what I'm saying? So. Maybe I hope you know this. How much uh -oh. <laughs> does the DNR have to do with like the right, like the writing? They have like a lot of scientists there who study things, and they have officers there who like enforce, enforce the laws uh -huh. and everything. But how much do they have to do with writing the laws? Is it they they're working I th with I think they have politicians? A, I think they have a lot to do. It depends on like what level you're talking. Uh, you can get things overrun. Like the governor in New York he wrote an executive order in order to ban bear hunting on um, public lands, which is unconstitutional in like 50 different ways. And I don't even know how, like, I love how like politicians decide what their new rights are. It's like, no, 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 that's not what the founding fathers had in mind. You don't get to do that. But anyhow, um, it just makes no sense. But in those instances where the, they sign executive orders and stuff, that's where the sportsman alliance would come in and kind of fight them in the legal system. And the DNR would give guidance on things. But, for instance, like the um, the wolf population in Michigan, there was a vote on it, and the way it was worded would scare anybody. And in that instance, you had to vote in order for, like, the vote took place, and I, don't quote me on exactly, but the way it took place and the way it was written was, if you vote no on this, you're also giving up your rights to vote on it in the future because then you're handing over all of the um, decision-making process to the DNR. But the way it was written would like intimidate anybody because who wants to give up the rights? Whereas, and then for instance, the the dove uh, for dove hunting in Michigan was put up to a public vote, public yeah. vote, which is the dumbest thing ever because it's not going to be based on science and how much of the population hunts and none of the rest of them are going to vote for yes. So like it was a guaranteed failure. Yeah, when I was telling when we have like the largest population ever here. Yeah, yeah, I was telling people about us going dove hunting and they would look at me with like mortified like. You're gonna kill those beautiful white birds. Yeah, the, it's the bird. I'm like, that's not, that's not what it is. It's that's not gray, what we're it's hunting. It's like a pigeon. <laughs> so, yeah, they, they, people don't even know what they're thinking. They can't even think of the right animal when. Some, they're good eating. We oh, made they were poached great. Poached ones in the episode. They were great. It was poached. Which, like, nothing poached, like, just in hot water to me ever sounds good, but that was great. We didn't poach them. Be careful. What did we do? Yeah. And, uh, what, what we did we, we do hunted then? them. And no, no, no. Oh, <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I was like, no, that's the recipe. We poached them. <laughs> He's like, no, that's what we Oh, did. yeah, because I just said it was illegal in Michigan. No, no, no. Okay, to be clear, we legally hunted them with the sportsman alliance. In Ohio. In Ohio. Came back to Michigan and cooked them. And when we cooked them, we poached them in water as a recipe. We <laughs> did not poach them. It was the way the we cooked themselves. them. Thank you. I was like... Why are you fighting me on this? That's how we cooked them. And you're like, no, no, but what you're saying sounds real dumb. No. Um, so I guess the whole point of this, to, to sum it up, is the laws do change every year. There is a bit of a disconnect between the DNR and the Sportsman Alliance. We want to protect the DNR. We want to protect the Sportsman Alliance. And we want to protect the hunters. So we created this platform. We'd love to have you all out at the Wild Game Dinners. Again, that information will be coming out on our Facebook later on next week and also on our website, thegreenmeoutdoors.com, when our new website comes out January 1st. So I'm real excited about all that stuff and hopefully you know, get to have you guys there. Uh, our tip of the week is actually Ryan's going to take the floor on this, but it's safety items needed for hunts. Yeah, so, I mean, even if you're just walking – half a mile out your back door onto your property there's still things that you should bring with you and i think most hunters know this but if you're just getting into hunting just just have it just to be safe because you don't know um, i was so proud when i brought the safety kit when we went bear hunting like how practical yeah, yeah i like just brought a case. first aid kit and i was like look at me being yeah, an yeah. adult <laughs> always prepared shout out to boy scouts yep 
Um, but I guess what I would bring with me is just your regular stuff, a knife, a lighter. That was a big one that you taught me. Always have a lighter with you. Um, and then some way of drinking water, those life straws. Are really cool. Yeah, they're really cool. We used them up in, when we went fishing up in Canada. And, I mean, I didn't get sick. <laughs> so yeah, it must have worked fine. I used that in the mountains in Colorado when I was elk hunting. Yeah, they're great. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to carry around gallons of water or a gallon of water. Just and drink mud yeah. if you want. Yeah. Just can't. They're I mean, really you cool. Could. They're really cool. I like how you still get the flavoring of, like, the stream, though. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of like per- that. Perfectly fresh water, yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, yeah, knife, lighter, and some way of drinking water is are my things. The two I would add to that is a first aid kit and a, uh, um, a rope. My dad always taught me to have a rope. Yeah. I always have a rope. Now I, like... Sub- I just buy ropes all the time. Like when we were in, uh, he's I bought like fascination three ropes. with rope. Yeah. He's like, you, you never know when you need it, and it's like, I'll, I'll be damned. It came up a lot. Like yeah, I yeah. need ropes a lot. Yeah, it did. So for the tip of the week, then the items that the Green Bay Outdoors team would recommend to always have is a knife, a lighter, a rope, and some way of drinking water, a life water. straw, and a big smile for the outdoors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna jump into our uh, social media comment of the week. So. This one, who did this come from? What was the name on this one? Richard Giltrop. And Richard wants to know, he said, I'm starting to get into hunting, and I'm wondering what a good animal to start off with would be. You know, a lot of people always say rabbit hunting. I'm like, that's dumb. Why would you tell them that? That's a tough sport. That's a tough sport. Very, very tough sport. First of all, they're fast and hard to hit. Second of all, you should probably have dogs, and that's, like, dangerous to have kids, like, shooting low at the ground. I'm not saying he's a kid, but a lot of beginners are kids. I'd be real. I would stay away from that. I've actually found that deer hunting... Because you're sitting still and you can take someone with you that can like walk you through the steps and it's like a real controlled environment half the time. I would recommend mine would be like white tailed deer in a blind with a rifle and someone with you. And then obviously tuning tune in to our episode this season of the Green Bay Outdoors where we actually go out with a bunch of kids and do a youth deer hunt. That was there's great. A, there's a lot to learn in there too. Yep. What would your recommendation be, Ryan? Um He's well, like timber doodle. Get I, him frustrated and upset yeah, right out him, of the gate. Yeah, make him as mad as possible. <laughs> well, I think it all depends on who you know. If you happen to have a good hunting role model with you, like I did, I was raised around with my dad, and I, thankfully he raised me. <laughs> he yeah. didn't put he me didn't out on the you. streets. Yeah. But, uh, he thought about it, he said. Yeah, he tells me every day. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I mean, it depends on who you know. If you happen to know somebody who is well-versed in whatever they're hunting – go with them they can it, like you knew a lot about grouse and woodcock hunting and that's mainly what i did growing up i did a little bit of deer and turkey so it's what you have access to it, yeah do what you have access to and who can teach you the most it it doesn't don't if you're don't your, do what's easiest do what interests you if you are on your own i would say the easiest would be squirrel though you, yeah you like you like anybody has a working knowledge of like where squirrels are but cleaning them is a pain in the butt, so make sure you know how to clean them yeah. ahead of time. So like, and it, you can just use a twenty-two. It's cheap. The ammo's cheap, or even a shotgun, and the ammo's cheap there too. What would you recommend, Mister Parks? Yeah. What about? What do you think? What I'm just thinking of this now. What about trapping? You did that at a young age. Yeah, and I wouldn't recommend that. That's pretty tough. Um, the uh, I would recommend deer hunting. Deer hunting. I, and I, I would probably re- recommend if you if you don't have a gun. And you need to buy a gun to go to your hunting. Buy a shotgun, and I, you can get into all the details of the shotgun. You want to buy a bird barrel and a rifle barrel. You need to be because then you can use them for both. That now you can go. You, you can hunt everything with that uh, in Michigan. Um, the rifle's good because you get a longer reach mm-hmm. or distance. Uh, and if you if you're drawing for elk, you can draw in Michigan. You can draw elk tag. You can hunt the elk with the rifle, but you can hunt the, the elk with a shotgun as well. The problem is getting close enough to get a good shot. Yeah. And then the next one I would recommend is squirrel. Yeah. And I, I would recommend it with with a shotgun. Um, you get your success rate up. And and you learn how to hunt. Yeah. Yeah, you, like, learn things. And the squirrels, like, in the woods are different than squirrels in, in, in the city. Like, yeah. the city they walk up to. Like, I've seen squirrels go around the tree to stay on the opposite side of you. Yeah. You know, yeah. And they, like, shuffle. They, they, get, they get smart. Yeah. And that's when you start picking things up and you throw it on the other side of the tree to make the squirrel think there's something on that side of the tree. So he runs around to your side of the tree. But that's all the stuff you got to figure out. Right. Deer will play games with you. Oh, yeah. If you don't see a deer, I've seen deer get down on their belly and crawl to stay out of sight from a hunter. Wow. 
they're educated. They've been shot at before. Yeah. <laughs> or they've seen somebody yeah. else get shot. Well, that's all we have for today. Um, also, I'd like you to go to our Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube pages. If you listen to this on the new Radio Media app, it is also available on uh, the Greenway Outdoors YouTube after the show. Um, thank you so much for tuning in, and stay green.